So it's a real honor for me to be here giving this tutorial today. Uh, I'm going to talk about a topic that um, was not so obviously interesting a few years ago, which is uh, quantum symmetric cryptanalysis. So first I will give a quite a long introduction uh, because I think it's important to explain the motivation, the context and, uh, and the state of the art of, uh, of this topic. And uh, then we will uh, see a, um, an illustrative case on quantum cryptanalysis that will present some of the best classical and quantum attacks on two popular constructions, which are even Mansoura and FX, and also some, um, some recent new uh, improved results uh, that we proposed uh, in HACRIP last year uh, with uh, an of, a way of using offline Simon's algorithm. And finally, I will discuss uh, some uh, interesting open problems and one more in particular that uh, I've, I've been personally very interested in it, but I haven't found a way to solve. So I'd be glad if someone has some ideas to, to advance in this direction. And we will, we will end with a conclusion. So, uh, well, that's a quite a generic introduction that uh, you all know that the aim of cryptography is to um, enable secure communications even in the presence of malicious adversaries. There are two big families. One is asymmetric, that does not need to perform a key exchange prior to establishing the communication, but that is computationally costly, and has um, a security that is based on well-known hard mathematical problems, like, for instance, factorization. And the other branch, which is the one that we are going to be talking about today, is symmetric cryptography, that does need to perform a key exchange prior to establishing the secure communication, but that is very efficient. So symmetric primitives have an uh, ideal security that is defined by the best generic attack. So for instance, if we have a block cipher with a secret key of size k, we can always recover uh, this key by trying all the possible all the possible keys, so it would cost two to the k, and that's an attack that can always be applied, and that's what we call generic attacks. So uh, in order to verify that the real security of the ciphers meets, meets this ideal security, we need to perform continuous security evaluations, and that is done through cryptanalysis. And uh, in practice, what happens in most of cases is what we use a combination of both families in what are called hybrid systems. So the main important families in symmetric primitives are block ciphers, stream ciphers, and hash functions. And in this introduction, I'm going to use block ciphers to illustrate the main ideas I want to present. Uh, Maria, well, just uh, yes? sorry to interrupt you. We're uh, sure. having a bit of a slide sharing problem again, as that we see uh, only part of the screen. OK, yes. So okay. we, you see. Maybe in the so worst we, case, you can, ah, not, not even worse. No, that's worse, OK. Yes. And maybe, now maybe you can shrink the yeah yeah okay now now it works okay so I can uh, I try to adapt it like this it's like yes. optimal I think right like, okay like this is good. yes okay I won't move the the shape anymore perfect thanks Fred okay so uh, as I was saying we will um, I will use block ciphers to illustrate this introduction so in block ciphers when we want to encrypt a message this message is composed in blocks of a fixed size and each block is transformed by the same function e of k so we have a secret key k and uh, the permutation the sorry the uh, plain text goes through this uh, encryption function to generate the cipher text and uh, typically e of k is composed of a round transform that is quite simple and that is repeated enough times so that E of K is robust. So the security provided by an ideal block cipher is defined by the best generic attack, as we previously said. Uh, so the best generic attack is an exhaustive search for the key, which costs two to the size of the key. And as we want that uh, this is not doable by an attacker, typical sizes of the key must not allow the two to the k generic attack to be doable. So that's why typical sizes of keys are 128 or 256 bits. And what we want is that recovering the key from a secure cipher must need at least two to the k operations. We cannot do it in less computations. Uh, so uh, how do we verify that the real security of the cipher meets this ideal security? And, uh, the only way of doing this uh, for now that we know in symmetric cryptography is uh, performing continuous security evaluation. And uh, any attack that we will find that is better than the generic attack will be considered a break. And that's why we are often left with an empirical measure of the security that is done with cryptanalysis. 
it's important to to understand the state of uh, of uh, actual symmetry cryptography to um, to discuss uh, the competitions that have recently and a bit less recently taken place, which were competitions to find new standards or to cover new needs, like, like for instance, the AES, SHA-3, or the currently ongoing uh, lightweight uh, NIST competition. And what this implies is that there have been many good proposals, many good candidates, or potentially good candidates. And uh, there are three important questions, which are how to choose the ones that should be used and how to be ahead of possible weaknesses and to keep on trusting the ones that uh, have been chosen. So the answer to all of these questions is with cryptanalysis. So when can we consider a primitive as secure? A primitive is secure as far as no attack on it, it's no. The more we analyze a primitive without finding any weaknesses, the more reliable it is. And that's why designing new attacks and improving uh, existing ones is essential to keep on trusting the primitives or to stop using the insecure ones. So cryptanalysis is a foundation on, of the confidence in the primitives that we use. There is a very important notion that we are going to uh, describe now, which is security margin. Because what happens if no attack is found on a given cipher? What can we say about its robustness? So the security of a cipher is not a one-bit information. Uh, we so if we cannot attack a cipher, it's not yes, we can attack it or not, we can't. Uh, what we do in practice is to have a look at uh, reduced round attacks. That means we said before that E of K is formed by the repetition of a, a usually simple uh, round uh, function. And so what we try to do is to see how many uh, rounds we are able to attack. And this will give us the notion of the security margin of this primitive, which is how far is the primitive from being completely broken. Sometimes we also analyze uh, the security of some of the components uh, of the primitive, as uh, for instance, in security proofs, uh, we we need to um, to make some assumptions on these components. So we try to to verify if these assumptions are verified or not, and if they are not, that means that uh, maybe uh, the meaning of the security proof is is different. So. Uh, it's very important then as a cryptanalyst to determine and adapt, keep on trying to find better attacks, which will reduce the security margin. And uh, this way, we always want to know which is the highest number of rounds that can be uh, reached by an attack. So just to uh, say that we seem sometimes uh, a bit um, too paranoid, but we think it's the way to go and to be able to trust um, the primitives we use. So sometimes uh, we have uh, we proposed attacks with, that have very large complexities. So for instance, as the keys that uh, we use are large, uh, we can find attacks that break a cipher uh, with a very high complexity. For instance, 2 to 120, which would be really far from practical for a key of 128 bits. But this is still dangerous because uh, they mean they apply weak properties that were not expected by the designers and because experience shows us that attacks only get better and that arrives very often that uh, a very uh, high complexity attack actually with time finds improvements and has the complexity that gets reduced and also because happily there exist many ciphers that do not experience these ugly properties. And uh, also, so it makes sense that when determining the security margin, as we want to know really um, the highest number of rounds that we can uh, attack, we push the attacks to the limit, which implies that sometimes the complexities we can reach are very high. But this allows us to, compl to compare primitives between each other and to anticipate problems. When the security margin gets very small, we might start to worry. So that's uh, kind of the the classical scenario, let's see now what happens uh, the post-quantum one, which is when adversaries will have access to quantum computers. So in the case of asymmetric cryptography, um, it's uh, widely known that uh, most widely used uh, primitives would stop being secure, and that's why the community has been for a while now looking for replacements, uh, as shows the current NIST ongoing competition. And um, the case in symmetric cryptography was a bit different, because for a long time it was believed that um, that uh, for to counter uh, uh, to resist or to have an ideal equivalent security in a post quantum world, it would be enough to double the key length, as uh, Grover's algorithm allows to uh, perform an exhaustive search in the square root of the classical time. But um, very little was known 
and um, and we have still a lot to learn about how to perform the cryptanalysis. We said before that it's so important when having quantum computing available. So uh, also it's important to say that um, the the existence of future quantum adversaries it's already a problem for present existing long term secrets. So we should start using quantum state primitives now. So there are two important tasks regarding symmetric cryptography to conceive more cryptanalysis algorithms uh, for correctly evaluating the security of these primitives and uh, use them to evaluate uh, the existing primitives to ident identify new gaps uh, of uh, primitives that won't be secure anymore and to design uh, the ones that will be filling these gaps for a post-quantum world. Uh, just a small remark on quantum attacks, because as we said before, um, an analysis is considered an attack when it's better than the best known generic attack. And quantumly, the generic exhaustive search is accelerated. So that means that um, if we are not able to speed up an attack as much as the generic attack, a broken classical primitive might be unbroken in the quantum setting, which might uh, seem a bit non-intuitive in the beginning. But this would just mean, for instance, that a primitive might not have 2 to the 56 bits of security again against a classical adversary, but might have 128 bits of security against a quantum one. It's just because we will mention this later. So now I will present the main attacker scenarios that have been used in the literature and uh, and and the related models. So uh, mainly I, I could find four models that have been considered. We have, uh, we can define the model Q0, which would be just uh, classical attacks with classical computers, so what we were doing until recently. Then we have the model Q1, which would include the model Q0, plus the adversaries have access to a quantum computer. Then we have the model Q2, that would include the model Q1, plus uh, the access to superposition queries to a quantum cryptographic oracle, while in Q1 all the queries are classical. And then we have the model Q3, where uh, we consider Q1 plus superposition queries to the differences of a secret key in a quantum cryptographic oracle. I will say a bit more about these models right now. So, well, Q0, there's not much to say, it's just um, the classical attacks um, with classical computers. And uh, regarding the model Q1, uh, which is quite a meaningful model because it just supposes that the adversary has uh, access to a quantum computer, so far uh, the best uh, we have obtained is quadratic speed up. But sometimes the speed up is smaller. That means that if we are uh, considering exhaustive search attacks, if a primitive is safe in Q0, it will also be safe in Q1. So does this mean that so far these exhaustive search attacks in Q1 uh, are not interesting? Uh, no. So for me, that's not the case at all, because some people might think that's OK. If, uh, so if it's safe in Q0, what's the point in looking at it in Q1? So uh, my opinion is that in a post-quantum future, classical or quantum surnames will disappear. And uh, the expected security will be given by the best generic attacks, for instance, Grover. And we will still need to define a security margin to see how far is the primitive from being broken. And this will be determined, determined by the highest number of rounds script analyzed with any attack, classical or quantum. And that's why this kind of Q1 results uh, in, uh, regarding exhaustive search attacks are important information needed for determining the unique and feature security margin. There's also an important thing to say. So, um, in Q1, which is a very recent result from this year Eurocrit by Akinori Asayama and uh, Yusasaki. And that is uh, regarding collisions, um, we don't have the same scenario as uh, exhaustive search as the quantum collision speed up is less than quadratic. So Akinori and you managed to show that we could build quantum rebound attacks, so collision, uh, a type of uh, attack to find collisions on hash functions that could reach more rounds quantumly than classical attacks, which was a very interesting result. And then uh, we will see um, what can we say about the model Q2. So it's a very powerful model because I recall that the adversary is able to uh, perform superposition queries uh, to a quantum uh, encryption oracle. Uh, but uh, I believe, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. We have a question from uh, yes. Jules Brassard. 
uh, yeah. who wants to know uh, in the Q1 model, how could you apply Grover's algorithm if you're not allowed to ask uh, queries in superposition? So for instance, yes, uh, thanks. It's a very good question. So um, we can apply it for instance. Uh, so in the, in the, this example I gave, it's because there are hash functions. So as there is no, uh, no key, there is no uh, superposition queries to, to be performed. And uh, so that's one thing. That's how you can uh, use Grover. And the other one is that, uh, it, so, the, um, sorry. When you apply Grover, it's the generic attack. And you don't need to uh, perform queries to a, to a quantum encryption oracle. You just know, uh, so the, uh, sorry, the block cipher description is public. And uh, there is a secret key that you can implement the description of the block cipher, and you can try all the keys. And this, you don't need a random oracle for doing it. So the generic attack can be done. You can do it on your quantum computer without needing to perform any superposition queries. OK? Yeah, you just try uh, that. That uh, answers the question? It does to me. Yeah. OK. OK. I appreciate that, so thank you. OK, perfect. OK, so now we arrive at Q2. And we were saying that it's a very powerful um, model. Uh, but uh, I believe that there are many good reasons to study security in this scenario. Uh, so I think the first reason is that it's a very simple model, and that's why it is used in many security proofs. So it seems it's a quite controversial model, because some people think it's, uh, well, at least in our community, that uh, the results are super scary and that it's very important. And some people think that. Um, that attacks in the Q2 model uh, are not important at all and that no one cares. And uh, I will, in the, in the final conclusion, I will talk about this a little bit more. But here, I will just give uh, the, some reasons why I think it's, uh, it's uh, 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 a model worth studying. So one is that, I say, as I said, that it's simple, that it's used in many security proofs. And uh, I think it makes no, no sense um, defining a model for security proofs if uh, we are not allowed to try to attack the primitives also in that model. Also, it's a non-trivial model, and by this I mean that many constructions still seem resistant. And uh, also, and very importantly, I think, is that it's inclusive of all possible intermediate, uh, intermediate scenarios, like when the primitives will be used in larger protocols that might, might um, for instance, have obfuscation, or when they are implemented in hybrid uh, machines that will have some quantum modules. And uh, I think it's also important to say that, uh, well, some people said that we could just counter Q2 attacks by performing a measure at the input of the primitive. But I think it's uh, very hard to say that this will be able to be done efficiently, in particular when, for instance, we cannot trust users uh, to do some much more easier tasks, like, for instance, stopping the or respecting the maximal number of blocks that can be uh, that can be encrypted with the same key. So I think that there are a lot of scenarios where uh, this this is not that clear that uh, so I think it's worth studying at least. So it has been uh, defined and used in many results uh, proof related and uh, attack related. And so I think that it's safe to say, and everyone would agree, that uh, at least if an, we find a, an attack in Q2, we need to be extra careful when implementing the primitive in a quantum computer and using it in certain applications. But we will come back to this later. And so the third model was Q3, that I recall was the model Q1, uh, with, in addition, uh, superposition queries to the difference of a secret key in a random encryption oracle. So Roy Teller and Steinwand in 2015 uh, showed in a very nice result that this model is so strong that everything is broken. So that means that this is a too, too strong model and uh, it's not very interesting to study it in because it's trivial. So everything would be broken here. There is another possible scenario classification of attacks depending on uh, if we are allowed to use uh, big amounts of quantum memory or if the quantum memory is limited to a polynomial amount. So we will call it scenario A and B. So I think that both are interesting, of course, uh, as before, uh, attacks in uh, less powerful scenarios are more meaningful. But as we said also before, uh, it's not a one bit information. If we don't find attacks in um, less powerful scenarios, it's also interesting to have information in some other scenarios. 
I think also results in the scenario A are interesting from a theoretical point of view and also allow to consider previously unknown trade-offs, and while the second one is a more realistic scenario. So let's see now a little bit the evolution of, uh, of the results in uh, quantum symmetry group analysis. The first result appeared in 2010. Uh, so Gaetan Laurent proposed a quantum analysis of the Cubash candidate of the Chatry competition. And Kuakadan Mori proposed um, an attack using Simon's algorithm on a three-month phase cell. Uh, also, Kuakadan Mori in 2012 proposed uh, also to use Simon algorithm to um, attack the even mass reconstruction that we will see later. And uh, Mark Kaplan in 2014 proposed a quantum meet in the middle iterated, uh, a quantum meet in the middle attack on iterated ciphers. And in 2015, Rettler and Seywand um, uh, published the uh, results on quantum related keys that uh, we mentioned before. So I think it, uh, these results were not published in well known conferences. And um, that's a pity, I think, because in the, for at least in my community, th these weren't very well known results, though they are very interesting. So more recently, in uh, around 2015-16, uh, with Mark Kaplan, Gaetan Laurent, and Denis Leverrier, we proposed uh, new results using Simon's algorithm inspired on Kuwakal and Morris attacks, but on new modes and uh, new constructions, and uh, also to uh, speed up slide attacks, which were which implied the first um, speed up of classical cryptanalysis better than quadratic. And also Santoli and Schaffner uh, published similar results in um, 2017 independently. And in 2016, uh, we um, proposed also quantum attacks uh, on differential and linear, so a quanti quantized version of differential and linear attacks. I, I forgot to say, sorry before, that I, I was trying to respect a little bit the colors of the models that I mentioned before. So the things that will be in pink are the attacks on Q2. The ones that are in kind of green olive uh, are Q1. And the orange one was Q3 that we won't be seeing much more. And the ones in blue are a kind of uh, generic um, generic algorithms that can be applied alone, depending on the applications in Q1 or Q2. So I'm sorry for colorblind people. I hope it can still be um, distinguished a little bit. So after the results from 2015 and 2016, I was very happy to see that a lot of uh, different um, different cryptographic groups and uh, colleagues started working on the topic. So there have been uh, many interesting results um, that have appeared on this. And uh, in our team, we have we are very lucky to uh, have an ERC for working uh, explicitly on this, which allows us to to expend a lot of time, time and a lot of manpower. So we have reached, uh, well, this is a non-extensive list of results we have reached in the last year. And this is possible uh, thanks to my two bright, uh, very bright students, Xavier Bontan and Andreas Rotenloer, and Antonio that recently arrived, as well as uh, the colleagues from my team, uh, in particular, uh, Andres Ayou and Anthony Leverrier, which are quantum experts, and also the, the colleagues from, uh, from NTT, uh, Yu Sasaki and Akinori Yamada. So um, I don't have the time to talk about everything. We will see. Um, in the next section um, offline Simon attacks that uh, were presented at Asia Clip last year. And uh, yeah, that's for it. So I will now discuss a little bit some useful, uh, so the quantum tools that I've found in the literature that have been useful for uh, providing improved attacks. And uh, so I won't go into the details because I'm sure you all know much better than me uh, uh, all of these algorithms, but I will just try mainly to uh, to present the problems that they solved and how do they appear in symmetry cryptography, and uh, what is the main speed up regarding classical algorithms. So uh, one of the most used uh, algorithms is amplitude amplification uh, that solves the exhaustive search problem that we already talked about. That is, uh, given a function, a Boolean function of n bits to one bit, find one element x such that f of x is equal to one. So classically, uh, the complexity is about 2 to the n divided by the number of elements such that uh, f of x is equal to 1, so the support of f. And quantumly, uh, the number of iterations, it's the square root of, uh, of the classical complexity. So it has many applications in uh, symmetry cryptography, not only, uh, for instance, in 
in the key recovery, but uh, it appears a lot when we are applying dedicated crypt analysis. Sometimes it's uh, very useful for speeding up some steps of the attacks that uh, that we are that we are trying to solve. Another algorithm that uh, is also useful is quantum counting. And uh, this one solves the, disting the, the problem of distinguishing a bias distribution. That is, given a Bernoulli distribution, that's a mine with high probability whether it is biased or not. So classically, we need about 2 to the 2 epsilon. Uh, so 2 to the minus epsilon is the bias. So we need the 2 to the 2 epsilon uh, data in order to, uh, to detect this bias. And uh, quantumly, thanks to the algorithm from Brassard, Brassard Oyer, and Tab. Uh, it's the square root. And uh, this algorithm is very useful for linear attacks. And we will mention it later when we will go back to linear attacks for the op open problem I wanted to detail. So another um, algorithm that uh, has been widely used is um, the quantum collision search algorithms that solve the collision problem that is given a random function uh, H uh, on n bits, find two distinct uh, elements such that they, their image through H is uh, the same. And classically, it can be solved with the polar Ross algorithm in 2 to the n over 2. And uh, quantumly, uh, in scenario A, that is with big quantum memory, it uh, can be solved thanks to Brassard Oyeran tab uh, with uh, an optimal time complexity of 2 to the n over 3, uh, uh, optimal query and time complexity, while needing uh, the same amount of quantum memory. And uh, well, we, there are also some, uh, some other algorithms for solving it in scenario B. Another popular algorithm in symmetry quantum cryptanalysis is Simon's algorithm, which solves Simon's problem. That is, given a Boolean function f on m bits, and the problem is that there exists s such that if the image of two distinct elements through f is the same, uh, the XOR of both elements is s, we want to find the s. So for solving this classically, uh, we can do it by trying to find a collision, which would uh, give us S. And uh, this is uh, with a cost of 2 to the n over 2. And quantumly can be solved with Simon's algorithm in a much better time complexity of O of n uh, to, to the power of 3. And uh, the number of queries is uh, O of n. So this might seem uh, like a quite an artificial problem, but actually uh, it's very easy to recognize it in several uh, situations in uh, symmetric cryptography. We will also see later, for instance, even Mansour and the uh, ethics constructions where it can be applied. And uh, another algorithm that is related to the previous one is, uh, well, the problem is related to the previous one is cooper bergs algorithm that solved the hidden ship problem with modular addition. So Simon solved the hidden shift problem with XOR. And here we have uh, S and G that are two injective functions. And uh, we have the promise that there exists S such that uh, F of X is equal to G, G of X uh, plus S for all X. We want to find S. So classically, it has the same complexity as before as uh, it comes down to finding a collision. And quantumly, it can be solved with the uh, cooper bergs algorithm in 2 to the O about 2 to the uh, square root of n. So these are the main tools that uh, have been used for now. Uh, I think and I hope some, some new tools will prove to be useful in the future. And uh, I will just list now some of the tools, uh, dedicated tools for uh, symmetric cryptanalysis that have been proposed. So there are some new uh, quantum collisions algorithms in scenario B uh, proposed that have worse time complexity but do not need um, a QRAM or a large amount of quantum memory to be performed. Uh, also, we propose some uh, quantum cakes or algorithms that um, improve uh, the previous known complexities or um, uh, Sasaki and uh, Oseyamada proposed some multi-collision algorithms that were very interesting. We will see the Grover meets Simon 1 for attacking the fixed construction that was uh, proposed by Leander and May in 2017, and also the offline Simon algorithm that we proposed last year. So the, the ones in blue are the ones that I will talk about later. And uh, there's also a Simon meets Cooperberg where uh, 
we solved the problem of the hidden shift when having several parallel uh, modular additions, which is also a, a case that happens often in symmetric cryptography. And then we also have some more dedicated tools. So now we have finished uh, with introduction, and we are going to um, we are going to talk about uh, the illustrative quantum cryptanalysis case that I mentioned before. So first, we will describe the even Mansour construction. We will uh, present uh, some of the best uh, classical attacks on this construction, and uh, next, the best quantum attacks in Q1 and Q2 that were previously known. Next, we will describe the fixed construction and the grover mitch simon attack in Q2 by Leander and May. And next, we will present the ideas for re reducing the number of queries of this FX attack. And finally, the, how to apply the offline Simon in, uh, in the previous constructions. So Ibn Mansour proposed in 97, it's, um, it's a, a construction that uh, from a public random permutation builds a block cipher. So we have a permutation P uh, on N bits and two, two N bits of, K, of key K1 and K2. And if we want to encrypt a message X, we have to XOR first the key K1 to it. Uh, then we apply the public permutation and then we XOR the second key K2 generating this way the ciphertext. The size of the plain text and of the ciphertext is n as well as the sizes of both keys here. So we know that any classical attack uh, requires that its time complexity times its data complexity will be at least two to the n. And data complexity are the, uh, are the queries to an encryption oracle or the number of uh, plain text that we can ask uh, to receive encrypted with the secret function uh, to perform the attack. So for instance, uh, one of the attacks that, that uh, verifies this T times the um, constraint is we could, uh, with two pairs of data, guess K1. So once we have guessed K1, with one pair of data, we will have determined K2. And with the second pair of data, we can verify if those values for K1 and K2 uh, verify that P2 uh, encrypts to C2. So that means that with only two pairs of data, we can try all the values of K1 in 2 to the N, and this will allow us to recover both keys. Uh, we could also uh, uh, perform a collision attack, uh, a collision search on the function F that will allow us a different trade-off of data and time. So if we define F of X like the encryption of a value X, so uh, P applied to X, uh, we can see that F of X is equal to F of X or K1, as uh, the encryption of X is equal to K2 times P of X or K1. And this would give us the same value for X and for X or K1. And in this case, we just want to find a collision between, uh, a collision between two different inputs to F, and this will allow us to retrieve the value of K1. And this would give us uh, a complexity of time and data of 2 to the n over 2. But uh, here, all the calls to f implies queries to the encryption function. That means that the data with this attack could not be smaller than 2 to the n over 2. So in 97, Diamond proposed uh, an attack that allowed to uh, have improved trade-offs with smaller data. For this, he proposed, uh, he defined two functions, h of x and g of x. Uh, h of x uh, was equal to the encryption of x XOR, the encryption of x XOR1. So it's a differential attack because we have we see that there's a difference between the two inputs. And g of x was equal to p of x XOR, p of x XOR1. So uh, it's important to see that g of x does not imply queries to an encryption function because the permutation p is public. And with H and G, we see that G of X XOR K1 is always equal to H of X. So that means that we can perform kind of the same collision attack as before. But now uh, the queries to G won't be queries to the encryption oracle. And uh, we can we have uh, a trade-off, uh, we have a better, uh, um, wider curve of trade-off where... Uh, yeah, quick quick yes. question. Uh, sure. Jill again, what, what is the... 
so yes, so these, uh, yeah, so I, I forgot to say it before, I'm sorry. So these, the data complexity, yeah, no, I said it, but in the slide um, here, I think. This is the data complexity. That, that means the number of queries we perform to the uh, encryption oracle. That is how many plain text we give uh, so that we get back the ciphertext uh, encrypted with the secret key, okay? That's fine? Uh, I think so. Okay. If uh, there are more questions on, yeah, don't hesitate to tell me. It's a data complexity. It's a number of uh, pairs that we, that we query. So, uh, for instance, in, in this attack where we have uh, D equal 2, that means we have P1, C1, and P2, C2. Very fine that uh, P1 encrypted with the secret key is C1, and P2 encrypted with the secret key is C2, okay? So it's uh, the yes, number of pairs, plain text, ciphertext uh, encrypted that we recover. So yes, we have seen that uh, with uh, diamonds attack, we uh, we have a, uh, many more trade-offs where we can reduce the data complexity. So what can we say quantumly about even Mansour? Uh, we mentioned before Kuaka and Mori and their 2012 paper. And uh, in this paper, they also proposed uh, Q1 attacks uh, with uh, big uh, quantum memory. So it's easy to see that in this attack where we are looking for a collision between H and D, we could apply, for instance, the DHT algorithm that would allow us to, uh, to find a collision with uh, a complexity of D times T uh, to the power of 2 equal to 2 the N, with a need of uh, D QRAM. So we could, for instance, uh, uh, we could query um, we could query, for instance, uh, h of x uh, 2 to the n over 3 times that we will store in a QRAM memory of uh, the same size. So d equal to, to the n over 3, which are the queries that we have applied. And next, uh, with g, we will uh, perform uh, an exhaustive search uh, to find a collision with the stored list. So it would cause us 2 to the n over 3 time also. Uh, in 2018, Yamada and Sasaki uh, proposed to use uh, an algorithm we, we presented in 17 uh, for solving the collision problem where no QRAM was needed, but you need a classical memory of 2 to the n over 7. So they could also attack uh, even Mansour in Q1b with uh, a data and time complexities of 2 to the 3n over 7. And uh, Kuwakada and Mori also proposed uh, an attack in Q2. And it's quite easy to see that um, we can di directly use Simon on f. So f is a function I, I wrote down uh, before in the beginning, which is uh, the encryption of x, xor, p of x. So this function has a, has a period k1, because as we saw before, f of x is equal to f of x, xor, k1. And this is exactly the... Uh, the, this is exactly Simon's problem. So if, if we are allowed to uh, perform superposition queries on X, we can apply Simon here, recovering K1 in polynomial time. So this is uh, previous results on even Mansur, and uh, it leaves some uh, open questions. One of the, uh, one of the, uh, one obvious one is, can we improve uh, these previous quantum attacks or are, are they optimal? And another one is, can we use uh, Simon's algorithm in Q1? which uh, we didn't know how to do before. So before answering these question, questions, let go, let's go have a look at the FX construction because um, what we're going to do there, it's going to be related. I think it's easier to, to start by talking about the FX construction. So the FX construction is, uh, it's very interesting uh, when talking about post-quantum symmetry cryptography because it's a, a natural uh, extension for doubling the key length. Um, for countering a uh, Grover, Grover's attack. So it's similar to the even Mansour one, but instead of having a public permutation P, it has an encryption function E of K with another secret key K. For the sake of simplicity here, we will consider that the secret key K, it also has a size N as K1 and K2. So uh, classically, uh, the best attacks on the FX construction verify that the time complexity times the data complexity is at least two to the two N. So classically, we see that uh, the bits of security are doubled here. And in 2017, Leander and May proposed the Grover-Mitt-Simon attack. 
where uh, it was an attack on Q2. And the idea was to uh, search with Grover the, sorry, uh, search with Grover the secret key K of the middle encryption function. And so they, they will apply Grover in a, in a variable K prime, and they will use uh, Simon's attack on Ibn Mansur as a, as a test in each Grover iteration to check if the corresponding function F K prime has a period. And F K prime is like the F we had before, but instead of XORing to the encryption P, we are XORing E of K prime, which is uh, the function we have in the middle and for a particular value of K prime will be known. So we can apply um, Simon to FK prime, which would uh, tell us if there's a period or not. And for the correct guess of the key, there will be a period. So the time complexity of this attack will be n to the power of three, uh, which is given by the test of Simon times two to the n over two, which is the cost of the Grover search over K. And the data complexity will be n times two to the n over two, which is, um, the which is sorry the number of times we need to perform n superposition queries for performing the simon attack uh, on the test so what we try to do first is to reduce this data complexity and uh, so the main idea is if we have a look at fk prime which this is a joint uh, work with xavier bontan akino ayoso yamada um, um, sorry, the PSME also. And uh, Andres Rotenloer and Yusasagi that appeared at Asia Crypto 2019. So if we have a closer look at FK prime, uh, we see that the first blue term, uh, Fx of K, K1, K2 of X, uh, depends on the encryption oracle because it's like, there are direct, directly calls to the encryption oracle, but it does not depend on K prime, on the value that we are guessing. And also, we can see that the second term, the red one, depends on the guess of k prime, but does not depend at all on the encryption oracle. So the intuition of the idea for improving the number of queries here is that in order to reduce the data complexity, it would make sense to make only one superposition query or a few superposition queries to the encryption functions and redu reuse them, if possible, in each test of the Grover computation, in the Grover iterations. So uh, more in detail, what we do is uh, pre-compute O of n states that will uh, each one contain a superposition query to the encryption function. And next, we apply Grover. And uh, in each Grover iteration, we perform a test that will compute the superposition of a k prime of x on the pre-computed states. Next, we'll check with Simon if this is periodic. And next, we will undo the computation in order to get back to the original superposition states of f x k k one k two of x, in order to be able to reuse the states in the next test of Grover. So, with this uh, procedure, we are able to reduce the data complexity to O of n instead of the two to the n over two that uh, Leander and May had in their in their attack, while the time complexity stays the same. So. Uh, now we will we go back to the question of is it possible to apply a Simon in the Q1 setting? So one uh, natural idea is to instead of performing superposition queries to try to simulate them. So um, we could, for instance, uh, perform uh, if we want to simulate one superposition query to the uh, even unsure uh, construction that we have here. Uh, we can uh, perform two to the n classical queries for all the values of x, and then we build the superposition state. So this would allow us to simulate one superposition query, but it would need uh, two to the n data and time, which is not very interesting because this wouldn't be an attack. So uh, what we proposed was uh, separate uh, the key k1, for instance, in two parts. And the, uh, the intuition is that one part of the key uh, K1 will be used uh, in a Grover search, and the other one will be used in uh, as a hidden shift, uh, and will be will be involved in uh, Simon's algorithm. So, uh, if we s separate, for instance, the inputs in a part with u bits, 
that will receive as input x and a part with n minus u bits that will have a fixed input of zero. And the keys, the key one is separated into parts also, key one, two, and key one, one. So the blue one uh, here in the down part and the black in the upper part. We can rewrite actually this construction the following way. That, as you can all see, it looks a lot like the FX construction that we mentioned before. So uh, we have, ah, sorry. So here we have uh, an input on u bits, which is smaller than before, for it's like key k1. And we can imagine or we can consider that the other part of the input that will have uh, a fixed uh, plain text part zero is directly the key k12, which will be a parameter of uh, the permutation p. And next we have k2 and we generate the ciphertext. So here we could, if we can uh, perform exactly the same attack as was done in uh, fx by guessing the n minus u bits of k12 with Grover. And the remaining u bits here will be uh, the remaining u bits of k11 will be the secret period of Simon. So all we need to do now is to generate the superposition of all these x, which can be done in 2 to the u now, which is smaller than 2 to the n. So uh, applying the uh, attack with these ideas, we will have a data complexity of 2 to the u classical queries, which are the ones we need about two to the u classical queries, which are the ones that we need for building the superposition one, and the time complexity of two to the u for building the super generating, simulating the superposition query, plus two to the n minus u divided by two, which is the cost of uh, building a grower over, over k12. So this implies a trade off curve of d times t squared equal to two to the n. So if we compare the results, um, uh, using these ideas to the ones we had before, which are the ones with the references in red here, uh, we can see that uh, we can improve uh, in even Mansour, we can improve uh, the previously Q1 known attack. So we can be in Q1B while before it was Q1A. So here, the attack in Kuakada Mori of 2012 needed a quantum memory of 2 to the n over 3, while now we only need a polynomial uh, amount of quantum bits. And when we compare to uh, the other Q1 attack that we had before, our query and time complexity is much improved. And in the case of X2, we can uh, considerately improve the, the amount of queries that we need uh, to perform the Q2 attack. And in Q1, we improve uh, both the queries and the time complexities. So to conclude this part, uh, we have proposed the best known attacks on Q1, Q2 for Ibn Mansur and FX, which can improve memory queries or time depending on, on, the, uh, on, the, on the case. And also we have proposed the first uh, Q1 attack that uses Simon's algorithm. Also, there are other applications of, uh, of these ideas, like some kind of slice attack or the related key attacks in Q1 also can, can benefit from this, this speed up. So uh, that's for, the, um, that's for the, um, the illustrative case. If there are no questions uh, for now, I will go to the open problems. And uh, I will list some of the open problems that I consider very interesting right now. And then we will go a little bit into detail to see how to improve uh, the key search of linear attacks uh, quantumly. So as I said, there are many things to do still. Um, I think an important question is to propose an efficient authenticated encryption mode uh, that would be q to safe. And by efficient, I mean in one pass like OCB, for instance. Uh, also, uh, could we find a new, uh, new, uh, new, um, out of the box uh, quantum attacks so using new tools like the QFT, for instance. So I think there are a lot of things to, to try. Uh, also, it would be very interesting to study the quantum security of uh, the lightweight primitives that are now being in consideration of the, uh, of the NIST competition. Is there a generic way to provide key length extensions on, on the primitives in order to resist to the best generic attacks quantumly? Um, I think also one of the uh, 
an important point that hasn't really been taken into account until now is uh, okay we say we need the bigger keys uh, for having an, uh, an equivalent ideal security in a post quantum world but uh, we haven't thought a lot about uh, what happens with the state so if the state which is of course harder to um, to increase and that's i think why we don't often talk about this if the state says the same uh, I think this might be a problem if we want to have a very high security regarding um, the key search. This would imply some some problems, some attacks in the modes when we try to collide in, in the states. So I think having functions with bigger internal states would also help avoid this kind of problems quantumly. And uh, also um, in Mark Stevens' uh, FSC talk in Brussels, he talked about, um, about trying to uh, find uh, improved quantum attacks on uh, on hash functions, so he talked about Shawan, I think, so I think it would be very interesting also. There's a lot to do regarding hash functions as uh, uh, you, Sasaki, and Akinori Oso Yamada showed us in Eurocrypt this year. And I think it's uh, it's a field that needs a lot of, uh, needs a lot of uh, study yet. And uh, also it would be uh, very important to, uh, to look in detail about evalu evaluating possible quantum implementations of algorithms. And then, of course, uh, proposing quantum versions of integral saturation in possible boomerang attacks, all of this. But now uh, I'd like to talk about uh, something that I've been trying to do for quite a while and that uh, I'm a bit obsessed with, maybe. So that's why I wanted to share maybe, it with you. Yes? Maybe you, uh, before going in there, there's a question from uh, yes, Ted, sure. Charma. Uh, is there a, any quantum attack based on entanglement properties rather than superposition quantum state attacks? And no, not that I know of. Sorry? And if so, how can we deal with such attacks? But, yeah. Okay, no, I don't know about it, and I, it would be very interesting if, so if he has some ideas, uh, I would be really interested to, to discuss it. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no more questions, I will then go back to the next part, um, which is about that if uh, it wasn't for the pandemic, I think I would have done on a, on a blackboard. So I try to simulate the uh, experience doing the slides by hand, but I'm not sure if I'm fully satisfied with, with this, with the uh, outcome, but well, here we come. So we will talk now about the linear cryptanalysis that was proposed at Matsui in um, 2000, oh, sorry, in 96. And I will try to uh, explain here a simplified version of linear attacks in order to, um, to provide the intuition of uh, the problem, I think, uh, would be very nice to solve. And also, when talking quantumly, we will talk mainly in Q2 because it would already be super nice to uh, improve uh, the non-complexities in Q2. So uh, the, the most basic uh, version of, uh, of attack that Matsui proposed in 96 was the linear distinguisher. So that is given a, if we have a block cipher E of K, if uh, we can find a fine approximation involving some bits of the plain text that are given by a linear mask alpha and some bits of the cipher text that are given by a linear mask, mask beta, such that this uh, affine approximation has a bias two to the minus epsilon, uh, we could distinguish this construction from a random permutation by uh, recovering two to the two epsilon pairs PC, and then we will be able to detect the bias. So that's the principle of the linear distinguisher that Matsui proposed. And uh, quantumly, uh, as we, uh, uh, we saw in 2016, uh, this complexity can be improved using the quantum counting algorithm. So instead of two to the two epsilon pairs, we would need two to the epsilon pairs. So the next uh, step of the attack, uh, Matsui's algorithm two was uh, to perform uh, a last round key recovery attack using a linear approximation on R rounds that will attack R plus one rounds. So in this case, uh, the affine approximation that we have, it's between P and C prime, which is a, a partial uh, partial internal state uh, instead of C, which is the ciphertext. And uh, from a certain ciphertext C, uh, we will need some bits of C and uh, a value, a part of the last secret key k, k out in order to compute C prime. So if we want to compute in the affine approximation beta times C prime, we will need 
a certain amount of bits of C, which is uh, and a certain amount of bits of uh, the last round secret key. And this amount of bits is the same because they are stored in the last step. So we will call it um, uh, size of K out, uh, the number of secret bits that we'll need to guess in order to compute C prime, in order to compute beta times C prime. And this is the same size of the invol involved bits of the cipher text. So how would the attack work in this case? Well, we can just guess the bits we need from the key to compute C prime or the needed values of C prime. And for each value, we will check if uh, when computing the affine transform, the affine approximation for all the pairs of data that we have, we detect a bias or not. So we suppose that we will only detect a bias when we are guessing the correct value of K out. So that means that uh, the time complexity in this case is going to be two to the k out for each guess of the bits we need in order to invert this part for being able to compute beta c prime in the affine approximation times two to the two epsilon, which is all the data we need to detect the bias. But we are going to see next that this can be improved. So up to now, uh, we could propose a quantum version of this attack which was as before, uh, the data one, we can use the quantum counting algorithm and it will be the square root. And the time complexity will also be the square root as the, the search of uh, the key out bits can be done with uh, Grover and uh, the data also, uh, the data we need to try for detecting the bias is also uh, reduced with the quantum counting algorithm. So quantumly, we have a square root complexity when we are in Q2 and now, uh, it comes the part where I haven't been able to say something interesting for now quantumly. So we can improve the last round, of, the last round attack from Matsui if two to the two epsilon is bigger than two to the k out. So if we have, if the size, if the amount of data that we need is bigger than all the possibilities for the last, for, for the bits of the secret key that are involved, we can improve this algorithm by using distillation. And the complexity is going to become two to the two epsilon plus two to the two k out. So let's see how, how we arrive to, to this complexity. As we said, uh, the, the amount of data two to the two epsilon is bigger than two to the, uh, the size of the last, uh, of the bits involved in, uh, in the inversion we need to perform in the end, which is the same size as the bits of the ciphertext that are needed to perform this inversion. So we can build a table T of size two to the size of K out from zero to two to the size of K out minus one, where in each, uh, at position I, we will store the number of times alpha P is equal to zero for all the pairs PC from the data that have the value I in the size of K out relevant positions of C. So that means that we take all the pairs of data PC that we have and we will make groups for the ones that have the same values in the relevant bits of the ciphertext. So these relevant bits of the ciphertext can have uh, values from zero to two to the size of K out minus one. And each time we will compute the number of times all the P's associated to those ciphertexts, uh, verify alpha times P is equal to zero. So uh, the cost of doing this of doing this is going to be two to the two epsilon because we have to go through all the data that we had stored. So once we have built this uh, table T of size two to the size of K out, we can now for each guess of the value of the secret T K out, go through all the table and compute the associated correlation. So the cost of this is going to be two to the two size of K out because we have to guess k out, which is two to the k out, the size of k out times going through the table, which is also the same size. So this can be done in two to the two size of k out, which with these two terms in green and blue, we see we, we recover the complexity that I said before, which is better than the one we had with the naive approach. But this complexity, the blue one can still be improved. So for improving this, uh, this was proposed by uh, Collard, Standard, and Chris Quater in uh, 2007. We will build a slightly different table TFI 
where uh, in uh, position i we will store the sum over all the ciphertexts that have i in the have the value i in the relevant positions of minus 1 to the alpha po points p uh, alpha times p sorry okay so we compute here uh, not the number of times alpha times p is zero as we did before but we compute the sum over all the ciphertext that correspond that have i that corresponds to the relevant bits of minus one to alpha times p. And next we will build another table, L of j, that will correspond to the values of minus one to the beta beta times c prime when k out equals zero. So here at position j, for instance, we will uh, we will put the value minus one raised to beta times c prime when c uh, so for a cipher set such that the relevant values are g, j. And here we store the associated value that will affect the affine approximation. And this table would be the one that corresponds to this value here when k out is equal to zero. But we don't know what is the value of k out. So what we actually want to compute with these two values is the sum that we can see here in the pink square. So we want to find the k out that maximizes the absolute value of this sum, which is the sum over all j of t of j times L of j, so k out. Because we want to find the shift between the two tables that when we multiply the values, we will find the biggest uh, value in total. Because this would give us the highest correlation. And this can be eff efficiently done with the fast Fourier transform with a cost of uh, size of k out times 2 to the size of k out instead of 2 to the 2 k out. So this is uh, the best complexity we have um, for key recovery linear attacks. So with the last improvement, uh, we have uh, a data complexity that is still 2 to the 2 epsilon and a time complexity that is 2 to the 2 epsilon plus uh, size of k out times 2 to the size of k out. And so my question here, is there a way of efficiently speeding up this improved attack using quantum tools, uh, such that it's interesting regarding uh, the, other, the other quantum attacks? Because uh, so maybe methods too close to the classical one don't seem to work better. Because for instance, for using distillation, we would already have to go through all the data, which would already cost more than uh, we are allowed to. So, yeah, we, we've been thinking about it for a while, and for now, we, if someone has some ideas, um, I would be very happy. And so we will now reach the final conclusion. I don't know, Fred, if there are any questions in the meanwhile. Uh, not so far, no. Okay. So, yes. So I think the general conclusion is that uh, there is no reason to panic, because symmetric crypto seems to be holding on well. Uh, for me, I think the most important outcome is that we should uh, consider a bigger internal state in the primitive. Uh, there's something that I haven't mentioned, but uh, it's quite nice that uh, several times it has happened that some ideas that we've had for um, for proposing quantum cryptanalysis have improved also, um, have been useful for improving the classical analysis we knew, which was also a bit surprising, but it happened, for instance, when improving the, the when uh, quantizing the, the, the mercy cells uh, meeting the middle attacks on AES, that we, uh, in order to uh, make the quantum attack work, we had to propose a way of solving things that was not intuitive at all classically. And actually, if you do it also classically, you can reduce the memory needs. So it was quite nice and, uh, and surprising. And I think there are a lot of things yet to do uh, to precisely evaluate the security, to find the best attacks, to adjust the parameters, the, there's still a lot of work to do. And just a, a short word about Q2, because I mentioned it before. So as I said, there's no consensus about the importance of results in this uh, setting for now. So some people say surprising scary results, and some people say useless mode. So in my humble opinion, I, I agree it's a very strong model. But uh, when possible, it would be better to avoid Q2 attacks. Um, so we have, uh, I have tried to show that uh, in symmetric uh, cryptanalysis, we are, well, uh, our way of working works quite well. And I think it's because we are 
really paranoid, so attacks on to, to the 200 declare sometimes ciphers broken. So, I mean, I think we are never too safe, um, but that's just my, my opinion. So I think that at least uh, it's information worth knowing. So just to conclude, uh, I want to say that there are lots of things to do. Um, also, uh, uh, a lot of things to do in asymmetric analysis, of course. Uh, there is, I think there's a real necessity to evaluate uh, uh, more the concrete security of the proposed primitives of the NIST competition. And there are possibly leaks between algorithms that work for both uh, types of primitives. So just, yeah. So if someone is interested in working in these topics or in the open problem or whatever, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thanks. Well, thank you, Maria, for a very nice tutorial. Uh, I'll just applause here from, on behalf of the audience. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so uh, we have time for questions. Uh, please don't hesitate to ask questions. And uh, we already have one from uh, Chris. Go ahead. Uh, uh, yes, I have a question. Like, um, so most of the, the speed ups um, that the quantum cryptanalysis gives over classical cryptanalysis are of polynomial nature. So how do you kind of answer the concern of people who study the actual implementations uh, of, say, of Grover search, and then the square roots basically go away um, if you start counting gates? Yes. So, uh, so w sorry. So the question is, how do you? Well, how, what, what, what's, how do you uh, deal with this concern that uh, some people are saying, well, if you actually look at, I mean, there have been the, the studies now, like, Mm -hmm. trying to break AES keys with Grover search. But if you look at the gate counts, then those are sometimes worse than even just classical brute force attack. So then they say, oh, we don't worry. Don't worry about Grover polynomial speed ups. This is not, not going to happen. So and uh, you don't think implementations can can get better or I mean, gate counts can? Well, I don't know. I, I'm sure you have been asked this question before, no? Like, uh... Yes. So yeah, I, I think that's why I, in the um, in the open problems, I think it's very important also to look at uh, gate counts and all of this. But I think that from a theoretical point of view, it's also very important to uh, not only rely on uh, the implementation would be to... Uh, so we don't know exactly how, th how much things will cost, uh, I mean, in the future, and I think it's better to be prepared anyway. And uh, and of, I think it, it, there are two uh, parallel uh, w directions that are very important to uh, to work on. But uh, I I think it's just saying okay, well this uh, this game counting uh, nearly uh, catches up with the speed up uh, means that we will stop caring about it. It's, it's not the way to go. Just, uh, that's okay. one. Yeah. And uh, yeah, maybe I have a question as well. Um, mm -hmm. So in recent years, there's been a lot of, uh, of research trying to pin down various quantum versions of security definitions, like uh, quantum versions of CPA, CCA, etc. And mm -hmm. maybe you could comment a bit on the difference between like how does uh, how do those definitions connect with the, the Q1, Q2 model, etc. So. Um... I think it's very hard to connect. So I'm not expert in uh, in security proof at all. So I, I get lost easily with uh, all of these notions. So I'm sure Christian could uh, comment better on this than me. But uh, so I think it's a bit uh, super complicated. And uh, we've been trying to work on the um, on the Q2 secure authenticated encryption mode that works uh, in one pass. So we have something that should work now. And it's true that uh, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of problems with the definition. So uh, yes, I. I think it, there are still a lot of work to do in that, that direction too. I, I don't know, Christian, what do you think or what would you say about this? But... I agree. I mean, uh, uh, the, the stronger you make these models, the Q2, I mean, basically, I think stuff that is secure in Q2, it will also be able to handle quantum data. Mm. Right. So I guess the uh, like Q1 would be some sort of version of CPA security, right? So I guess it'd be interesting to, and I guess Q2 is not really CCA or anything like this, right? So I guess it'd be interesting to mm. see if you, what happens in a, in a CCA model, like can you, can you get stronger attacks or something like this? Yes. Sure, yes, would be nice. Um, I do have another question. Like you were uh, showing this, this quantum attacks on the, on the FX mode, mm -hmm. um, but somehow, um, how do they compare to the classical attacks in the end? Like the best ones you find classically, what is kind of the time memory trade-off if you multiply these things, if you compare it to, to, to classical? 
So uh, in the FX attack of uh, Leander and May, which was uh, very nice, I think, uh, when, you when you multiplied that on time, uh, you still had 2 to the n, which is kind of what you want to have uh, quantumly, right? Because, uh, so uh, FX construction classically gives you 2 to the 2n. Mm -hmm. So uh, you say, OK, then when you grow you are comparing with the square root. So if you have d times t 2 to the n, which is what Leander and May gave, should still be fine. But the thing is that with uh, the query um, improvement that we proposed, this uh, multiplication goes down. So then you have d times t, it's uh, it's 2 to the n over 2, kind of. So so it, it's, it's much uh, worse security-wise, I think. So that's an indication that this fx is not just going to like double the security for you. Uh, yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I, mm -hmm. So it so it was uh, kind of a surprise uh, in the the paper of Leander and May in 2017 because uh, the time could go uh, to to all of uh, n over two times mm -hmm. to the n over two, but uh, with uh, additionally with the improvement in the queries one, even the product does not uh, respect the uh, the equivalent uh, notion that should maybe be uh, considered quantumly. So yeah. Do you have lower bounds for this? So do you know how how? So. So actually, working on the authenticated encryption one, we kind of found found that uh, for even Mansoor, the Q, the Q1 uh, attack that we propose is uh, kind of optimal. But uh, it's also very recent, and uh, I think there are still a lot to do to prove uh, which ones are, yeah, more bounds, and uh, yeah. it's still new, I think. But yeah. I have a quick technical question, Maria. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So. This, this quantum algorithm that you mentioned for distinguishing a biased from a non-biased uh, distribution, how does this quantum algorithm have access to the distribution? Does it get sort so of a proposition where the probabilities are in the amplitudes or? So I think you uh, it's kind of a variant of the amplification amplitude one, right? You, you need a superposition in the inputs, in all the inputs. It's uh, It only works in Q2 anyway. Sure. Um, but right for distribution, you don't have an input. I mean, that's sort of why I'm, I'm asking. Right, classically, I guess sort of a classical L distinguisher gets sort of samples which are independently chosen from this distribution. So I think you, you just build a, a superposition. Yeah. So you get all the, uh, you have all the inputs, right? You, you get a superposition on all the X and all the, uh, that will generate all the outputs. And then there you are able to verify uh, no, sorry, maybe I don't. Right, sort of a classical distinguisher for a one distribution from another, right? He gets, has access to samples from, well, one or the other distribution, right? Yes. So the algorithm can sort of push a button and then you get sort of a sample which is chosen from distribution P or distribution Q and then your goal is to, to distinguish, I mean, to figure mm -hmm. out whether these samples come from distribution P or distribution Q. So now I wonder, I mean, what does a quantum distinguisher uh, 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 get uh, to, to see from, from one or the other distribution? Does he also get to see classical samples? I guess not. I guess he needs to have some, some stronger uh, uh, sort of access, some sort of superposition access. Yes, completely, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. What does that now mean? Does he get a superposition of all the possible samples where the amplitude yes. or, or the probabilities, well, square root of the probabilities? Yeah, yeah, that's it. I think uh, it gets a superposition of all the inputs, yes. But, but I'm, I'm confused because you're saying you're speaking of inputs, right? It is, you don't, there, there are no inputs, right? You, you get sort of a sample uh, or... or well, I, I, when I mean input, I mean... It's not a function, right? The function is an input, right? And, and produces an output, but the distribution produces samples. Uh, so I'm confused when you speak about the superposition of inputs. So uh, if, if we have a look at the, uh, of, uh, at the encryption case, no? Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm actually sorry, I'm not sure I understand sorry, the... Uh, Right. I mean, you, you were talking about sort of a, a algorithm, a quantum algorithm that that can distinguish a, a, a non-biased from a biased distribution. Yes. Sort of my question is, what sort of access? I mean, of course, somehow the algorithm 
needs to get information from, from the distribution, I mean, from one or the other. So my mm -hmm. question is, what sort of information does, does, does the algorithm get? Again, sort of, the, I mean, a classical algorithm gets samples from one yes. or the other distribution, classical samples. Mm -hmm. So the classical one uh, has queries, right, to an encryption oracle? Yeah, the, the classical algorithm queries an encryption oracle? I mean, not if we're talking about an, an algorithm that distinguishes one distribution from another. So I'm not sort of thinking well, query, about okay. using this algorithm to breaking some encryption scheme, just sort of a, mm -hmm. thinking of an algorithm that is, that, that is supposed to, to distinguish a uniform distribution from, an, from a biased distribution. Yes. Uh, right. Uh, Okay, so, uh, so the question is, what is the input of the algorithm? What sort, yeah, that's maybe one way to phrase it, or in, what sort of information or what kind of information does the algorithm obtain from the distribution? Again, sort of classically, it will obtain samples, right? Like for, Again, for example, I, what, what I would guess you would, you would get was something like you, you push a button and from distribution P, what you would, I guess would get uh, would be a, like a coherent superposition of all possible samples. Is that yeah, yeah. I mean, that's sort of what I was suggesting as well, right? To get sort of a, a state that has sort of as amplitude mm -hmm. all the square roots of the of the probabilities from the distribution. Is yeah. that sort of line what you're saying, Fred, as well? Yeah. Well, that's a, that that seems like the. I mean, it's the only way I can think of. That okay. Like yeah. The, the way to interpret it, but uh, I don't know. I think okay, that, good. Uh, we can also, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there is another way because yeah. you could just like uh, enumerate samples. You can just have say on, on, on input one, you get a sample, on input two, you get a sample, on input three, you get a sample, and then you get superposition access to this one, two, three, four. Also, you have multiple distributions somehow. No, always from the same distribution, but you just have independent samples depending on the input you give. And you could have like superposition access to that. I know this has been tried before, okay. but I don't but know. But I mean, in a way, that's sort of what I'm asking, right? Because you could think of, of, of different ways to get sort of superposition access to a distribution. It's sort of not clear to me if I don't know if they're all equivalent or not. Uh, but we can also maybe talk uh, about this some more offline uh, in case there's some more questions. Yeah, which, uh, which there is. Uh, there's another question by uh, Shu Kao. Uh, maybe we can unmute. So you should be able to talk. Uh, okay, or uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so my question is that uh, is there a quantum speed up for the linear crypt analysis? Um, so is there a a common speed up? Yeah, for the linear crypt analysis. Yeah, a quantum speed up. Is it, uh, so uh, you mean beside the ones I talked about, or? For non-linear yeah, so, cryptanalysis. So yes, yeah, so in the talk, you many talks about uh, some linear cryptanalysis. So I'm wondering, so for non-linear cryptanalysis, are there some auto similar results for some quantum speed up, some for strong no attack using? Okay, so you mean non-linear cryptanalysis? Yes, yes. Okay, so it's true that non-linear cryptanalysis is less. Uh, so you mean using a non-linear approximation, right? Uh, like uh, differential cryptanalysis. Ah, some, okay. So, yes, so differential cryptanalysis, I think there are, so we also propose some versions in the same paper as in the linear one. And uh, the thing is that uh, with linear cryptanalysis, there is this final magic, uh, well, magic, the, the kind of very nice trick to accelerate and improve the uh, key recovery complexity that you don't really have in differential cryptanalysis. So, uh, so, uh, yeah, so th there are some uh, quadratic speedups in differential cryptanalysis that uh, we proposed before. But uh, so I, I was particularly interested in uh, improving this uh, last step of the key recovery of linear ones because I think maybe the, there are some surprising things to do regarding quantum attack. I'm not sure if I answer your question. You can uh, develop more if, uh, if you want more, more information. Yeah, I think that answers my question. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, great. So uh, I don't think there are any more questions. So uh, I'd like to, uh, to thank Maria again. Thanks. Laugh a bit. And uh, so she'll be available for, for any further discussions in the, the meet and greet room. Mm -hmm. And uh, otherwise, uh, we reconvene at 2.30, so in about 25 minutes.